This is episode 54 of a series where we examine the cut content, design, and development of Fallout New Vegas. In today's video, we're taking another deep dive into locations that were either changed or cut. The map shown at Res 2013 revealed the Mojave was once much larger and that many locations were cut. This was made very early in FNV's development, as many areas from the final game aren't present. For instance, Camp Golf is missing, and in its place is an area called Las Vegas Bay Campground, a real-world camping spot. This area would later be cut though, and there's no remnant of it. West of Good Springs, there was a settlement called Sandy Valley, a small, real-world mining community. The community formed around five mining towns, one of which was called Ripley, and this location appears on the early map. This area is on the border of California, so perhaps it was an NCR settlement. Both of these areas would have been placed beyond the invisible walls and western mountains of the final game. There's still some rocks and plants here the player can normally never see, suggesting that some work was done on the area before it got the axe. Though it's also possible these were generated automatically, but it's unknown how they were placed. Real World Sandy Valley is bordered by the Spring Mountains mountain range, and a cut area would have appeared here called Mountain Springs. Outside the playable area north of Tribal Village, there is even a cell called Mountain Springs. There's an audio marker left over, suggesting the area might have existed in some form before it was cut. The terrain is more fleshed out than most inaccessible areas, but there are no clues as to what they intended for it. It seems that Tribal Village would have been in a different location if Mountain Springs had been included, and perhaps it was moved here once the map was reduced in size. One cut area was called Griffith Peak, and its cell is still named that. This mountain actually appears in-game outside Jacobstown, but the entire area is blocked off by invisible walls, so it can normally never be explored. West of New Vegas, there was meant to be a settlement called Summerlin, an area that was notably purchased by Howard Hughes, one of the inspirations for Mr. House. Another cut area was called Knob Hill Mine, and despite being cut, Knob Hill is still mentioned in the official guide. This rarely tracked area offers exceptional views of the river. At this point, there's a filled in mine shaft that used to lead to Takata Cup Mine. It's then mentioned a second time in the section on Takata Cup Mine. Also known in the past as Knob Hill Mine, this hole in the ground is at the turnaround at the end of the road from Nelson, and seems to have been a dumping ground or storage area for radioactive waste that the Legion now occasionally utilizes. It's worth noting that Takata Cup Mine wasn't on the early map, so perhaps it replaced Knob Hill Mine. Perhaps it was once going to be an additional access point into Takata Cup Mine, but was later filled in after it was cut. Alexis, the Legion soldier inside Takata Cup Mine, had all of his dialogue removed, and I can't help but wonder if it was related to Knob Hill being cut. There are other areas on the Res map like Corn Creek Dukes, Devil Peak, Floyd Lamb State Park, Colada, etc., all of which are real world locations, but it seems that none of these were ever implemented. If you've ever taken a good look at the world map, you might have noticed some locations have circles around them. Others have multiple circles, and some have none. You might have thought these had some in-game significance, but the actual reason they appear is pretty stupid. Locations that can be discovered on the Pip-Boy map have a map marker. These markers have a radius, and when the player passes into it, the location is discovered on the map. Likewise, audio markers have a radius, and if the player is inside of it, a specific sound file will be played. Obsidian created the world map by taking screenshots from the GEC, 
that were then stitched together, and as a result of this, you can see the radius of these markers all over it. This map is fascinating because it's not up to date in all areas. One mystery I'm invested in is the Van Graaff Warehouse. I've mentioned that it was originally placed somewhere else, and that's because the ground textures suggest that an L-shaped building was once placed there. Well, on the Pip Boy map, there's a mysterious L-shaped building that couldn't be the Van Graaff Warehouse since it's a rectangle shape. Whatever this building was will likely always remain a mystery. Mystery, though. The map found in the Remnants Bunker is from an earlier point in development than the world map, and it shares numerous differences with it. Many of these changes are downright esoteric, like settlements being in different locations, or the layout of roads changing. For instance, Boulder City streets are shown, suggesting that it was still a part of the wasteland at this point, but on the world map, all of these are missing. It also shows New Vegas and Freeside highlighted, similar to the way DC is highlighted on Fall 3's map. Some of the roads in the southwest part of the map near Mojave Outpost hadn't even been implemented yet. There is also what appears to be an even earlier version of the world map in the game's texture files, but I'm not sure what this was intended for. Most of the world beyond the playable area is vast empty spaces. However, there's a large bomb crater south of Nellis Air Force Base. This is far beyond the playable area, but its very presence suggests there are plans for more of this region to be explorable. Mr. House mentions that 11 warheads got through his defenses, and this was clearly meant to be the impact from one of them, so it's too bad you never get to see it. There's some interesting out-of-bounds content north of the Devil's Throat. There's a large number of Joshua trees and rocks, and while some of them can be seen from the playable area, not all of them are visible. Further north, there's a weird-looking wall of rocks. They were placed here to hide the fact that just beyond them, the Colorado River ceases to exist, and so does the world for the most part. The terrain for the river actually continues much, much further though. Intriguingly, there's another bomb crater not far from here on the eastern side of the river. This area is outside the Pip Boy map, suggesting the world was planned to be even larger than originally thought. It's unknown if this area was going to be explorable, but surely it was at least meant to be visible, perhaps from a cut legion area since it appears on the eastern side of the river. Northwest of the Devil's Throat, there's a super mutant camp near a cave entrance, but the cave doesn't have an interior. Presumably they meant to add a dungeon here, but never had time. There's also two other cave entrances with missing interiors in the immediate area. The location Cazador Nest has a similar inaccessible cave too. Interestingly, this cell is called SL Mole Rat Nest, suggesting that it was meant to be infested by mole rats. This area's name wasn't updated in some translations, and is named Mole Rat Nest in the German, Italian, French, and Spanish versions, despite the fact that mole rats don't appear there. The Brotherhood of Steel Bunker has a cut room not far from where Knight Torres is found. It's possible this was her sleeping quarters, or perhaps it was where her shop was originally located. This room will always remain a mystery though, as all that remains from it is nav mesh that was deleted in a patch. North of the 188 trading post, there is a location called Deserted Shack, and this cell is named SL Wastelander Shack 01. There is another cell just outside the 188 named SL Wastelander Shack 02, but there's nothing here. Presumably there was meant to be an additional location here, but there's no remnant of it beyond the cell name. The Remnants map shows the 188 trading post was once found much further east, almost right next to Boulder City, but was later moved to its final location. 
It's possible the Wastelander shack was cut during this transition. There are four small destroyed buildings outside Boulder City, but there were two additional buildings in the initial release. The world space that Boulder City appears in was never updated, so you can clip outside its interior and still find them. Strangely, someone placed a stem pack in one of these houses, despite the fact the player can normally never reach it. FNV was meant to have an elaborate hobo language. These symbols were meant to communicate a wide range of information about locations, everything from telling the player to go left or right, if a place is worth robbing or dangerous, or even if water is good or bad. One of these symbols warns the player that a town has a jail, which is interesting because while there are a handful of jails in New Vegas, they serve no real purpose. It's very plausible they considered a crime system at one point, as previous Bethesda games like Oblivion and Morrowind had them. While all of these symbols are present in the core game, only one of them is ever used outside the test map, and it can be found at the New Vegas Medical Clinic. It's the symbol for a doctor being present, but since the player has absolutely no way of knowing what it means, it's nothing more than the last remnant of a really cool cut idea. It's unknown if the player would have learned the meaning of these symbols through trial and error, or would have been told about them by NPC seas, perhaps by prospectors or refugees. This would have been an awesome addition for observant players, and it's really too bad it never made it in. Recently, a modder named Friendly Non-Murdering Sort restored the hobo code to many areas in the wasteland, and there's a link below in the description if you want to check it out. There are some interesting buildings in the test map called No-So Apartments Destroyed. These assets are numbered up to 8, but only the 3rd and 8th building are used in-game, and the 7th building is outright missing. A while back, I mentioned that the NCR Correctional Facility had a cut prison block. It seems the prison was meant to be even larger, as there's an unused armory sign, but this seems to be all that's left of the area. Two buildings from Fault 3's location Paradise Falls can be found here as well. The dev team created three new buildings specifically for New Vegas from these assets, but they were also never used. There's also some cut signs for Fremont Street and Las Vegas Boulevard, which would have been a nice detail for both areas. We've discussed how the Strip had a south gate near Camp McCarran that was cut. It turns out it also had a western gate at 1.2, and you can still make it out during this early footage. This was apparently in-game when the All Roads comic was drawn, as it's clearly shown in one of its pages. This road still leads right up to where it once was. In some ruins close to the gate, you can find a somewhat hidden dead gambler. In the final game, his placement is strange, but it makes much more sense considering there was once a gate here. It seems that some of FNV's art was created by using the cut south gate and west gate as references. You can see the Las Vegas sign from the south gate area, but parts of the scenery match up with the western gate. Intriguingly, this early footage also shows a group of intact houses and some buildings in the top right corner, but all of these are rubble in game. It also shows a building behind Sunset Sarsaparilla HQ, but it's also destroyed in the final game. The buildings near the El Rey Motel were intact as well, but were later changed into ruins. A very tall white building is also shown inside the strip's walls, but it was also cut. As far as I'm aware, this is the only footage where the building was ever shown, so it'll likely always remain a mystery. Not far from here in Fiend Territory, you can find three destroyed brick buildings. If you travel inside the South Vegas ruins and then clip outside of bounds, you'll see these buildings were originally all intact too. 
There's a nearby series of fortifications at the edge of Fiend territory, but no one is guarding it and it serves no purpose. If the Western Gate had appeared, perhaps we would have seen soldiers or mercenaries defending these fortifications against Fiend attacks. Maybe we would have seen NPCs living in the houses outside the gate and gamblers traveling to the strip. It seems this entire area was meant to have more going on, but in game, it has no significance apart from the Sunset Sarsaparilla HQ. By comparing the Remnants map and the World map, you can see the road I'm standing on once curved much further west and went right past Violet's trailer. It's possible this change isn't significant, but it's also possible that Fiend territory was originally placed further west. Perhaps once the West Strip Gate was cut, the fiends were moved closer to the city, and the once preserved area around it was turned into nothing more than a ruin. So the Strip's North Gate appears, while West and South Gates were also planned. This begs the question if there was once an East Gate as well, but this part of the city was never shown in early footage. I've mentioned that LVB Station was once probably a part of the Strip's world space. It was in fact a part of it at one point, as shots of an open LVB station are proudly displayed on one of Mr. House's security monitors. It's awesome to finally see what this area was meant to look like, and as you exited the monorail, you would have had a beautiful view of the Lucky 38. The playable area once wrapped around the entire tower, but either side of it would later be closed off by junk walls. Despite that, some of the area you'd see from the monorail is still present, and it's pretty cool to check out. The station also had two signs originally, but one of them was removed by a patch. This shot shows a bus stop and a mailbox by the Lucky 38, both of which were cut. Also note how the Lucky 38 had these dope red and yellow neon patterns, and then compare that to what we got in the final game. This early screenshot shows a mysterious cut building behind the Lucky 38. Behind this unknown building, there's a construction crane that was also cut. It also shows the Lucky 38 taking up a much larger amount of space than it does in the final game. In fact, the Lucky 38 tower is scaled to be 10% smaller than its model. The Lucky 38 sign is much smaller than its model as well. There is even evidence of the other casinos being reduced in size. The tops being shrunk down can be seen when comparing the building in the strip world space and the tops courtyard cell. On the strip, the entrance area is clipping into the model behind it. In the courtyard, the entrance area juts much further out and isn't even close to clipping. It's cool this original layout still exists and gives us a better idea of the scale they intended. The top sign is also in a different location than it is in the final game. The same thing happened to the Ultralux. On the strip, part of the dome clips into the model behind it. In the wasteland though, it juts much further out and doesn't clip. This layout can still be seen in one of the loading screens. Also note the way the road looped around the fountain and led to the entrance, but this is sidewalk in game. There's these large wing sections on either side of the building too, both of which would later be cut. The LOD retains some of the strip's original layout, and you can see this by clipping outside the area. As we move away, you can see just how much of the Gamora's geometry was deleted. The LOD also shows one of the doors from the top's courtyard, suggesting that it was once a part of the strip's world space. Once it was moved off the strip, they threw up this weird looking wall to stop the player from seeing what's actually around them. This early shot shows the Topps Diner and Aces Theater were both a part of the casino floor, but they were later closed off and moved to their own cells. I've mentioned how the Tops had its interior changed during development, and it seems the other casinos went through similar changes as well. The interior of the Gamora shown at E3 was actually twice as large as its in-game counterpart. 
Zooming into this out of focus shot of the Ultralux from E3, and then comparing that to how it appears in game, shows that it looked much different and was more colorful. It appears to show additional entrances into the Ultralux too. There's an unused Ultralux slot machine, revealing that slots were considered for the casino, but there are no slots there in the final game. Speaking of slots, they were much more lucrative in the original release. Placing a bet of 200 caps and getting triple oranges would win 20,000 caps, which is far beyond the winning limit of all casinos in the game. Obviously, this was pretty broken, and the maximum winning limit would later be reduced to 7,500 caps. In Freeside, there's a planner in the middle of the road. This same road layout seems to be shown on the strip in this early blurry shot, but it never appeared in game. There was once a room behind the reactor in the Lucky 38 basement, but most of it was deleted. Its original layout can still be seen in the official guide though, giving us the only idea of what it once looked like. In Ivanpah Dry Lake, there was once a planned encounter where the player would come across fire ants eating a dead bighorner. This was probably cut because of the high concentration of enemies in the nearby area. This isn't the only case of content being removed from this region either. During the quest, Can You Find It In Your Heart, the player kills fire ants not far from Mojave Outpost. A note in the related script reads, Creatures move from Ivanpah Racetrack area to nearby Underpass Canyon to avoid interaction with random ants. There's an unused area called Vault 74 in the game files. This is actually a part of Fallout 3's GEC tutorial, but was strangely included in the core game. It's possible they intended to use it in some fashion, but it's most likely just leftover Fallout 3 content that Obsidian was given by Bethesda. There are two houses called Good Springs House 02 and 03 that were clearly meant to appear in Good Springs, but neither does. The second house is used a few times in Nipton, while the third house is only used once near Horowitz Farmstead. This one is particularly cool as it's intact and you can explore it without a loading screen, so it's too bad it wasn't used more often. There's an unused diner from Fault 3 found in the test map world space. This diner was used early in development in Novak, but would later be replaced by these tents. The diner was likely used as a placeholder before the tents were created, but interestingly, the cell is still named Novak Diner. There's a test version of the diner that wasn't present in Fault 3, but it's missing. I wonder if this test diner was meant to be Rita's Cafe, a location that's teased in multiple loading screens but doesn't exist. It's notable that all the locations shown in the loading screens appear, except for Rita's. Victor has four greetings that were meant to be played in Novak, but they were never recorded. These lines read, Well howdy partner, you made it out of Good Springs no worse for the wear, good for you. Well don't that beat all. It's my old friend from Good Springs. I reckon you'll be tracking down that varmint now. A man puts you in the grave, has it coming if you ask me. A piece of advice, watch yourself around Nobark. I think he's studying to be a halfwit. The Novak Motel was originally made from a single mesh, but it was later broken up into three smaller meshes by a patch. When this change was made, two water troughs outside the lobby were cut. They also changed the bungalow houses found in Novak. Originally, all three houses were a single mesh. Note the vent on the front of the house, the two windows on the side, and the chimney. They were patched to use three separate meshes, and the new versions have a shaded end door, and the sides are partially destroyed. These were nice additions, but each house also lost one of the windows, the vent, and the chimney during this change. Presumably these mesh changes were made for consoles. 
In one of the ending slides, a Mojave Express drop box is shown outside Novak, but it would later be moved inside the motel lobby. It's too bad there aren't more drop boxes, as they were a great idea, but their usefulness is limited as there's only five of them across the entire game. This slide also shows a mailbox that never appeared in any version. 14 unique golf signs were made for Camp Golf, but only one of them is used. Interestingly, it's used twice, once outside the Misfits tent and again inside the interior. The interior flag is placed outside of bounds, and the whole area seems to have been copy and pasted from the Wasteland world space. This early screenshot shows the NCR's camp at Prim had a different layout. You can even make out a ranger and a sniper's nest here, but in the final game, rangers never appear in Prim, and this building is inaccessible. This screenshot shows that Prim originally had trees and concrete planters, but the trees and planters were later cut. One of the ending slides shows a destroyed pylon, but in game there's a water tower in its place. Zooming into the screenshot, you can make out a group of houses behind these trees that don't appear in game. The houses that do appear in Prim are in a cell called Prim Houses 02. The cell where the cut houses were shown is actually called Prim Houses, but there's no trace of them in the final game. The Remnants map shows Prem's roads extending much further south than they do on the world map, and it seems these roads were cut alongside the houses. This cut residential area would have gone a long way in making Prem seem like a real town, rather than the empty shell of one found in the final game. Modder Ludo restored these cut houses, and there's also optional files to restore other aspects of the town. There is a link below in the description if you want to check it out. It seems the Vicky and Vance Casino might have been created to be one of the inaccessible fluff casinos on the Strip. It's named Casino Board at 01, and the Vicky and Vance signs aren't a part of the model. Instead, it just has lettering that spells out Casino. Its name is potentially notable, as boarded implies that it was going to be inaccessible. The main entrance to the casino in Prem isn't used, because none of the doors in FNV actually fit into that space, which makes sense, assuming it was intended to be inaccessible. There's probably several hundred instances of objects that are placed beneath the ground. In some cases, they were covered up when an area was reworked, like this manhole beneath the road on the strip. In other cases, I think they were moved by mistake, like this destroyed lamppost at Jacobstown. It seems the world height of some areas was slightly increased, like this area near Bonnie Springs, where there were a bunch of rocks underground. Covering every one of these objects would be beyond the scope of this video, but I find hidden content like this fascinating. There's a section in the New Vegas documentary where Josh Sawyer talks about his motorcycle trip into the Mojave Desert during FNV's development. A short clip taken near Prem is played, and it shows a much higher plant density than anything we ever got to see in game. Here's the same general area for comparison. It seems they generated these plants specifically for the documentary, but it would have been amazing if they could have included this much plant life, and it would have been closer to mirroring the real world Mojave. A modder named Voidwalker recently discovered some unused weather settings and shared these before and after comparison shots. The colors were more realistic and look better than what was used in retail, but I can also see why this was never implemented as the nights were almost pitch black. There are likely even more locations that were intended to appear. You can generally tell the order in which objects were placed throughout the world by looking at their form ID numbers, and in many cases, the inaccessible static doors found throughout the wasteland were added much later in development. 
I suspect the designers plan to include interiors for at least some of these locations, but once they realized how little time they had left to finish the game, their ideas were scrapped and these buildings were permanently closed off. Further, I think that some buildings were turned into rubble once it was clear there wasn't time to make interiors for them. On top of this, the large number of unused Fallout 3 assets were probably intended to be used in some way, but never would be. These changes, particularly a larger world and more locations, would have made FNV into an even better game. Ultimately though, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.